here. Oh my god. I'm getting I need Blair a new closer mic here. Stand. So we're live now. Blair is adjusting her mic with her old mic stand and her autofocus camera. <laughs> I'm falling apart, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get the microphone a little bit closer because I noted that Blair was a little quieter. Testing, and, one, two, three. How's that? And Justin. That's good. Are we good? Identity four. Are we good? The Did human I torch guess? could not acquire a bank loan. <laughs> the arsonist had oddly shaped feet. <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> What did I miss? <laughs> Anchorman. You know, just a cool, oh, like, almost yes. 20 years ago. No big deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. A movie that I never saw. Oh. oh. Identity Force oh. was I've never quiet. seen Anchorman. Maybe that's one oh, that's, on my homework. that's on my homework list. Okay. Yeah. Homework. So, okay, watch so Anchorman. Identity Blair is still quiet. quiet. Should I try Let's... these different switches on the back of the mic? No, now you're way quiet. <laughs> okay, how about now? Better, worse? Go. Yes, better. Hello, testing, one, two, three. Yeah. Identity four, you got it. I've got a weird headphone, so things change. It's better. better, they said. Okay, I'll try the third one real quick. Okay, testing, one, two, three. Testing, that testing. Oh, it's yeah. flat. I like the second yeah. last one. You got it. Back to number three. Okay, number three. Behind door number three. Wait, let me three. double check Elsa. I'm just going to. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, because if it's the camera speakers, that would explain everything. No. No, you're on the right camera. That's for sure. Everyone, Microphone thanks for joining us yeah, on Twist microphone. tonight. If you're watching live right now, that's it. That's the show. We're done. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, Welcome to our here. first podcast, everybody. Our oh, first man. podcast ever. Yeah. Uh, it's hard sometimes to get the audio right before we go live because what you hear is not necessarily what we hear. And as much as we do That's stuff right. in the back end here, it doesn't sound that way to all y'all out there. So, Blair, stop I, moving. Your autofocus is freaking me out. I'm so hot, guys. I don't know. My house is so hot right now. Is it hot in San Francisco? Oh, yeah, I can't San Francisco's go having a really, really warm fall. I can't it go back to the It just gets Central warmer Valley. and warmer mm, in so the hot. Bay Area in the fall. But, you know, we can talk about climate change. Oh, I have a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so um, right before we went live, I said, you guys, let's do a tight 90. We'll get in, we'll get out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm happen. ready. <laughs> See, I had to get this. Tight 90. We're in. We're in. We're out. <laughs> you. Oh, it's much better, that fan. <laughs> you know, I use as much metabolism to make more heat to move the fan as I am dissipating with the fan. But it's fine. It feels as good. As you heat yourself up, you will also vasodilate and... <sighs> instigate all those natural cooling mechanisms like sweating that will allow the evapotranspiration to take place a little bit better and cool you from the Let me surface. just say, uh, you might be able to hear me, you might be able to see me. I'm glad you can't smell me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the live <laughs> recording of the Twist broadcast, everyone. <laughs> <sighs> All right, let's start. I'm ready. <laughs> for another episode of Twist. And uh, if you're here watching live, well, then you are watching the stuff that people who listen to the podcast aren't going to get to enjoy. So I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you are enjoying it. We are going to go live. Are you ready for a show? I'm ready for a show. We're ready to Record in the three, the, 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 the three, two, one. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 795. Recorded on Wednesday, October 14th, 2020. What is room temperature but super cool? I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with ants, bears, and COVID, the ABCs of science. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. 
Whatever you think about the state of the world, keep in mind that the world of today is but the yesterday of tomorrow. And what is left to say about the world of tomorrow that hasn't already been said? For one thing, there have always been those that think, that think things might get better. Optimists. And of course, there are always those that think uh, things would get worse. Pessimists. And depending on which one of you listen to more, you are more likely to think one way or the other. And depending on what state of the world you happen to be tracking, you are probably going to be right or wrong or maybe even both. CDs aren't going to last. Vinyl has a better sound than digital. CDs are the future. Digital music is here to stay. Both right, wrong, both. Regardless of how you think about tomorrow, there is another way to envision it. One that is neither through the optimistic nor pessimistic lens, but rather by following scientific perspective. Breadcrumbs of what's to come, of what is possible, of what is probable, of what is most likely to be our tomorrow has always shown up first as published science. And the best way to catch a glimpse of that world of tomorrow is right here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back. We're back with all the science. All the science that you are looking forward to because you've been looking forward to the science since last week because that's what we do. We come back every week to talk about the sciencey things, ABCs of science. I have, let's see, science news I brought, fishy smells. Fluorescent bears and fluorescent bears and potentially negative positive selection. Hmm. Potentially negative positive selection. Okay. I'm just going to have to suss that out with the double Mm -hmm. negative. That's a lot of words. It's a lot of words (laughs) in a row. Work that out, everyone. Justin, what do you have for us? I've got systematic racism, skin circuits, COVID spiracies. And how a pandemic kept the Paris Climate Accord promise. Oh, <laughs> that I, I can't wait to hear about that. Blair, mm. what's the Animal Corner got in store? Uh, I have some bee guts. I have some really smart ants. And uh, I have a real quick story about uh, kind birds. Oh, I always knew they were so kind. I mm. love them so much. Yes, I saw this story and I thought... I wonder if Blair's bringing this story. And I went to go put a story into our rundown, and there it was. There it was. You better believe it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All right, everyone. Let's kindly dive into this show. But before we do, I want to remind you that if you, you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us all places that podcasts are found. Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, Radio.com, Apple, Google, Spotify all the places go look there look for this week in science you can also do the same on youtube and facebook or look at our website twist.org. okay let's do this science thing are you both ready for some scientific action super conductive what what temperature is no longer a limiting factor when it comes to superconductors Wait, what? Well, it is, but not less so. They've broken a barrier. Scientists, physicists, publishing in Nature, researchers from the University of Rochester, New York, have created the world's first room temperature superconductor. Again? World's first room temperature. Like, really room temperature. 
Yeah. Okay. So superconductors conduct electricity without any resistance. It's like the electricity just flows, man, and it does it 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 encounters no resistance. There's no draw on the electrical flow. Very efficient stuff. The idea of room temperature has been something researchers have been after for a very, very long time. Because normally so they're far... doing it when it's super, super cold, right? Because then yes. there's not all the jiggly, jangly, knockety round <laughs> atom activity stuff going on. Exactly. And magnetic fields and atomic interactions are all very important for the superconduction to take place. And so, yeah, it's usually sub- Sub-zero temperatures we're talking about, but no. Oh, no. 15 degrees Celsius, which is the equivalent of a very, very balmy 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's not bad. It's not terrible. I mean, that is a very cold room temperature. That's a normal day in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> Super conductivity cold. while wearing a jacket. Yes. Yeah. Um. So... All it takes to create this new room temperature super superconductor is a few atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur squeezed at 203 degrees Kelvin and 155 gigapascals of pressure between two diamonds with a laser. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and when that pressure, which is over like over two million times atmospheric pressure yeah it's, it's a lot of pressure these gigapascals when that when that pressure happens just right the atoms just go chemistry magic and they do their thing and they turn into a superconductor and the electricity just flows but they have absolutely no idea what the final molecular conformation is so if somebody were to ask these researchers well you know like in their paper so what does this superconductor material look like they don't know. It just happens. It's under such intense conditions still while at room, te room temperature um, that it they, they still have more investigation to do. But that room temperature barrier has been broken. So from now, it's investigating the structure and moving forward to decrease that pressure a little bit to make, make us live in a superconductor world. Very Practically awesome. make one in your kitchen. Pra practically. You know, just take a couple of wedding rings, little kid's laser pointer, totally yeah. can do it. Yeah. Someday. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Someday. Okay, Justin, did you have a story that's going to not be fun to talk about? <laughs> no. I have none of my stories aren't fun to talk about. Okay. Uh, the person I got about is Racism. It's that thing that we often think about in American society these days in terms of police, mm -hmm. as in racist police officers being bad actors in society, specifically when it comes to black citizens. Uh, while the anti-racism protests have been oddly countered by people claiming that they are pro-police, uh, it's a, which is interesting because it's a different argument than the thing that's being protested. Uh, Sort of like saying that you don't want cockroaches in your cereal and then having somebody else go, oh, no, you don't like cereal? Cereal's awesome. Why do you hate cereal? And you're like, no, <laughs> it's the cockroaches that are getting into the cereal that are the problem. And then so that, so anyway, <laughs> uh, there is there are people who, who apparently like cereal, whether or not it has cockroaches in it. They, they don't seem to care. Um an examination of police departments. I have departments. a story about this, but we don't need to. We don't need to go off on a sideline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I mean, because yeah, this, 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 yeah. Uh, cockroaches are leading to the deaths of many innocent uh, Americans uh, across the country, and so something should be done about it, regardless of whether or not you know your cereal doesn't have them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Examination of police departments uh, in major U.S. cities. Uh, by a management by management professors at the Indiana University Kelly School of Business, which sounds like an interesting place for this to come from, right? Found that it may not just be individual officers on the beat who are acting from a place of bias. Uh, so then we've we've gotten, but the actual uh, police departments themselves, which so now you have the closed box. 
within that closed box of cereal that has not been opened, no cockroaches can get into it, no interactions in society, there's still cockroach feces, apparently. They consistently found that black officers were more frequently disciplined for misconduct than white officers, despite an essentially equal number of allegations being leveled, and this uh, included allegations of severe misconduct. Quoting here uh, from the paper itself, uh, from the research, uh, we found a consistent pattern of racial differences in the formal recording of disciplinary actions in three different major metropolitan cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. Our results showed that black officers were more likely to have recorded cases of misconduct despite there being no difference between black and white officers in the number of allegations made against them. It is impossible to know whether these differences are due to racial bias versus some other unmeasured factors. However, it is noteworthy that the pattern of results is in line with what, uh, what theories of racial bias would predict and with evidence of racial disparities in punishment in other settings. In other settings, meaning uh, the previous studies that have shown that uh, uh, black people are more likely to be charged, more likely to get the maximum charges by prosecutors, um, see higher discipline rates in schools. The, I think we talked about a little over a year ago the uh, the two and a half times more likely to be shot by police. The fact that they're in this, and the number is not just slightly more too, it's they are more than twice, uh, disciplined more than twice as often as white officers, which does fall in line with all the other statistics across other segments of society when discipline is involved uh, in, in differences in racial. Uh, in Philadelphia, uh, so in Chicago, they were disciplined more than twice as often as white officers. In Philadelphia, it was 48% more likely than white officers to have been disciplined. Allegations of misconduct could even be uh, include things like lack of service, verbal or physical assault. So it was sort of a wide range. Uh, after controlling for the number of allegations of misconduct, they found that black officers were disciplined actually at an even higher rate. Uh, uh, 132% more often uh, than white officers. So that's not 100% meaning equal and then 32% more. It's no. a hundred, it's twice and then another third, okay, as often. Just as bias by police against citizens has been very slow to change, the professor's right, it is likely that any bias within police departments has also been slow to change. They found no differences in the number of allegations between black and white officers. One of the sort of things that is sort of interesting too is that they found that uh, allegations made by other officers are more likely to result in disciplinary action than mm -hmm. allegations made by the public. And that black officers were more likely to be accused of misconduct by other officers than by the public. Hmm which uh, is what is sort of driving these numbers as well. So then, yeah. then when you look at it, then you can see, oh, there might actually even be a bigger gulf within these numbers. Uh, also interesting, just side note, some of the information that they, that they called for this, uh, this study had to be achieved through Freedom of Information Acts, uh, simply requesting this information uh, and, and in, from the police departments for this transparency was not enough. They actually needed Freedom of Information Act. The lawyers and the, the involved to even get the information in the first place to, to look at this. Uh, for those of you who are pro-police, uh, fine, let's just look at the police officers. <laughs> Racism I am, is still there. I am pro police. I think police are. are it's, I think it's great to have police. I am glad that there is that there is scientific inquiry into questions of how the system is built, though, because I do see that the evidence, everything's pointing to there being a major problem with race, and things need to be fixed. And so, if we can get closer and closer and closer to being able to, I mean, have have more arguments. I mean, yes, there's of how to how to fix it. You know, where to change it. It's not just in the policing on the street, but within 
the police forces themselves. I mean, this is this is systemic. It's institutional. Things need to change. I think, you know, par- part of this, too, is that there's a systemic racism in in everyone, everywhere, every place that you've grown up. There, there's things that are baked into it. And yeah. we would like to think that police officers are the best of us. So the people that know how to be measured yeah. and to shoot as a last resort, yeah. that they are trusted, that they are impartial. It's mm-hmm. it's reminding me of another conversation we're having right now, like who's supposed to be on the Supreme Court. It's supposed to be the best of us. It's supposed to be people who are impartial and honest and don't have these biases. And of course, no person is like that. But right. how can we make sure that the people put in these positions of power are the most like that possible and are given tools to nurture that part of them and not these other more ugly parts of them that are baked in. Or how do you change the system so that the system does not allow for or can can weather some of these biases, can, can you know, can be like the, yeah. you know, the pH. Yeah. So that's kind of like, <laughs> what do you do right now? And how do you fix it in the long term? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And those are two very different conversations. It, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work. That's so, what needs so, to happen. Yeah. Uh, so. I, I might suggest that um, one of the things is that the, the way that police are portrayed uh, through our television movies, they're, they're a common character. Uh, and they're usually pretty violent and being shown as powerful with a gun. Um, and they actually spend about 95% of their training time training for violent altercations, despite the fact that that's less than 2% of their job. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so what, what we're doing is we're attracting also uh, individuals to become police through this mythos that... Um, predisposes them to have some sort of aggressive or desire for power. Um, I think I think it's important if we showed policing as more of the Columbos of the world, if, you can, <laughs> if anybody remembers this, this police officer show, uh, as more of the thoughtful reasoning, question asking, um, maybe more in the lines of, you know, they interact more with the homeless than they do violent criminals. They interact more with people with mental illness than they do with violent criminals. If we showed that, I mean, it doesn't maybe make for as exciting television, but you might attract more people who do want to be honest brokers of law and who do want to, you know, the, uh, what was the show with the whistling? protectors of the people. Just, you know, they're they're just there to support people and business. Like you be there in the neighborhood. Your friend, we don't neighborhood sh- police officer who yeah, helps you out. We don't show that. So it yeah. shouldn't be a surprise that we have a militarized police department. But also this, but this one, when I was but saying science. pro-police, it's in the argument of, of course, um, whether the police uh, are acting racistly in, within our society and whether you just want, good, you, you believe the police are fine despite them being racist. The point is the racism is affecting police officers in their careers. So if you do truly care about police officers, know that they are also suffering from this racist environment. Um, That's a great point. That it needs to change. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a great point. All right. Now that we've talked about these problems, let's talk about some kindness (gasps) and sharing. Yes. Blair. Um, So, you know, we've all been there. We've tried to uh, encourage maybe another individual to share, to be generous, to show empathy for someone else who has less, if that's a toddler or a friend or a relative. Um, But this uh, recent study that was um, with uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, University of Vienna and Swedish Lund University. I hope I did okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't think they have the... (sighs) That's the Yiddish and Hebrew coming out. Anyway, um, showed that uh, birds might show some empathy, sympathy, and might have some instinctive behavior uh, that allows them to help one another. So there there was earlier research from uh, the main researcher looking at uh, how birds sometimes do things for other birds, which isn't too surprising considering that we see that kind of stuff happening across 
different types of animals. You know, we see animals assisting one another. If they're social or not, we can still see this kind of altruistic behavior popping up. But they wanted to see if it's instinctive, if it's ingrained, or whether it's flexible, and how they take into account the need of the other animal. How is their observation of kind of what dire straits the other animal is in impact their action? This was on Azure Winged Magpies and uh, gave one a bunch of mealworms, the other one none. And then there was a mesh in between them. So the, the one with the abundance of mealworms could feed the one without through the mesh if they so chose. And they did find that they are inclined to share. Um, but they do seem to identify if the other individual has mealworms or not. They're not just always sharing their food. They're saying, oh, you don't have anything. Let me give you some of mine. Females mostly shared only if the others had left nothing, but the males tended to share no matter what was going on. So the females are a little more choosy. <laughs> they think that that might have to do with a quote unquote advertisement from the males. Look at me. I'm so generous. I'm very mm. physically fit and you should come <laughs> check me out. Uh, but anyway, uh, with the females, they, they really wanted to see if the other individual needed it or not before they shared. And they didn't need to beg. The, they shared food whether or not the one without mealworms kind of begged for help. So there's a whole question of whether this is sympathy, whether, whether this is empathy, what all that means. It depends on how you define all that stuff. They'd like to look at this in further individuals, see if they can observe it in the wild, see what other bird species do. But ultimately, if you want to call sympathy or empathy, like recognizing the hardship of another individual and wanting to alleviate that hardship, that's what this looks like. Hmm. That's really interesting. I mean, it's a huge question about social animals to begin with, you know, what maintains that sociality? What kind of, mm -hmm. what kind of relationships do they have where they, where they give to each other or don't? We, we know vampire bats do with regurgitation, right. which is so interesting because just that's life or death. Just regurgitated blood. Mm. Oh, yeah, just a little, I'll give you a little taste of my, of the yes. blood I ate today. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's so interesting to think that other birds would now. Yeah. The magpies, these azure-winged magpies. Now, I'm just wondering, in terms of passerines, they like these are these are smart birds. Mm -hmm. These are yeah. smart social birds. These aren't like little tiny bush tits or yeah. warblers. These are these are bigger brained. They're little. They've, they're probably a bit more complex in their social behaviors. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I would I would love to see other social animals tested in a similar way to see how it turns out. Yeah, totally. And I would love to also see if these are birds that they that were raised together in the lab, if they're physically yeah. related, genetically related. So these are all things that I would then wonder is at what point do you care or not care? Because I think that's really what empathy is, yeah. right? If it's if it's kind of bring boiling it down back to the selfish gene of your success is my success of my genes, then it's it's kind of old school altruism that we've seen before. But mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter if they know this individual or if they're related, then I think it fits better into this empathy category. Yeah. So um, uh, Florida scrub jays are a social social breeding species where you'll have uh, offspring of parents helping to raise the next generation because they haven't left the flock and they haven't moved on to find their own mates and it is more advantageous adv advantageous to them genetically to help rear their parents offspring uh, because they're related and that's a definite genetic benefit but when it comes to yeah something like this i don't yeah with the bats they're in the same cave right but they they don't necessarily have to be related so I don't know. Yeah, different, yeah. different, different, different stories for different species. It would be very interesting to work that one out. Definitely. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right, moving from birds, let's jump into fish. Fishy smells. That is. Can can the two of you smell when like the fish smell? 
Like when you go to the definitely, the, I can also the see your store. webpage there if you're meaning. To oh, show I forgot to stop the screen. <laughs> There's the whole story. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, everything. I can smell the fish down the hall for sure. Justin, can you can you smell fishy smells? I as of today, I can't smell anything. Not today. <laughs> Not today. I'm kidding. They're making fun of me. They're calling me saying I had COVID. Early. No. Uh, yes. So like a fish market. Uh, mm-hmm. like, yeah, hits me from halfway down the, the city. <laughs> I have to say, though, as someone who enjoys eating fish, I don't hate it. It's not like an assault on the senses. Right. It is to me. It to is me, to me. Like, the, to me, so. like I, I start to, I, uh, like, w- walking down to uh, Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco or that uh, fish market that was in mm-hmm. Seattle kind of a thing. Uh, I'm like, yeah, if I if I actually just grew up by the sea, I would probably wouldn't eat fish. <laughs> no, I think you would. You'd be used to it. But see, Fada in the chat room put he really brought up the thing. You know what I cannot handle when someone puts fish in the microwave at work. That oh, smells no. terrible. Oh. Why would you do that? Yeah, <laughs> that's bad. Anyway, anyway, everyone, fish but, smell but, really but moving it into the science. Five minutes on on fish smell. Just, what do you have to tell us? You catch a it's fish, genetic. It's genetic. How bad that fishy smell smells to you, your aversion to the fishy smell. Yeah. It's genetic. Oh, Researchers uh-huh. looked at those Icelanders and uh, looked at their genome for mutations in olfactory genes, in olfactory receptor genes specifically. And they found there's one particular variant for a gene called TAR, T-A-A-R, TAR5. And when it is mutated just the right way, people don't smell the fishy smells as much. Mm. They don't They don't get to smell it as much. They don't find it as aversive. So there's a reduction in, in their scenting of fish. Additionally, they found another gene variant, uh, variant P lice two three three ASN in gene or six C seventy. Yes, if you are a geneticist, you are loving these letters and numbers put together. <laughs> what this gene does is uh, it changes your ability to smell cinnamon. Or, and there's another variant in there as well in the same gene family that also changes your ability to smell licorice. Oh, the licorice smell. The licorice Mm. smell, yes. So these are uh, the, the molecules that are specifically involved for the fish smell are trimethylamine. And so this TAR5 gene reduces affinity for trimethylamine. Uh, the Orc six or six C seventy gene changes the uh, the ability to smell trans anethol, which is also in fennel and licorice root and all sorts of licorice smelling things, mm. and also the cinnamon gene is tran uh, is an increased affinity for trans cinnamaldehyde, which is the scent of cinnamon. S- so I might have extra ones of those genes because if there's even a hint of cin- cinnamon, uh, I, I'll pick it up. I will. I will absolutely smell. Mm. I cannot stand it. To me, to me, it's the same smell as burnt hair, human hair. Like if <laughs> Interesting. You've ever, like, it's the same thing. It's a, and it's. I think I might have been in a past life, like some sort of insect that liked bark, and then I got to the cinnamon tree, which is, and it was. Uh, Oh, this is poison. It's a uh, and to you. It's a, right. It's an insecticide, and to you, it's also not great for you. And so, it's wonderful that you can smell it. And only thing I don't like about Christmas. <laughs> not, right. It's the only thing I don't like about Christmas. <laughs> but in general, for Start results like this, to be doors. able to to be able to determine that these, uh, you know, specific mutations change our ability to either. Uh, to smell these things at all, so diminish or enhance function, or to change tolerance for certain compounds in the air. It's, you know, this is all a genetic, it's all genetics, and it's really interesting that we can tie such such very 
uh, important smells. These are big smells, fish, licorice, cinnamon, um, that we can tie that to genetic variants. Mm -hmm. Well, they're they're tied to locations, right? So that kind of yeah. makes sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, cool. Tell me about some tattoos, Justin. Uh, so it's not tattoos, but this is more like henna. Hmm. Like where you can just sort of draw it on and then wash it off later. Uh, this is printing sensors on skin, uh, which has been a problem because the process of bonding these silver nanoparticles that uh, together in order to make circuits for a sensor typically uh, require temperatures around 572 degrees Fahrenheit, 300 degrees Celsius, uh, which is just fine if you're a silicon chip. Uh, but you wouldn't want to try that on the back of your hand like henna. Uh, enter uh, Hanyu Larry Cheng, professor at the Penn State Department of Engineering Science and Mechanics, who was published uh, in ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. The quote voice. The skin surface cannot withstand such a high temperature, obviously. To get around this limitation, we proposed a sintering aid layer. So sintering is that... That sort of bonding, melting together reprocess. A sintering aid there, something that would not hurt skin and could help the material sinter together at lower temperature. So by adding a nanoparticle mix to the mix, uh, the silver, nano, uh, silver particles sinter at a lower temperature, about 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees uh, Celsius. <laughs> so that is still too hot. Uh, Cheng says, who points out that uh, it's still too hot to put it on skin. So we changed the formula again. We reworked it. We redid it uh, and found that they could get it all the way down to room temperature. Room temperature sintering. A layer consists of a polyvinyl alcohol paste, the main ingredient in a peelable face mask, as well as calcium carbonate, which comprises eggshells. The layer reduces printing surface roughness and allows for an ultra thin layer of metal patterns that can bend and fold while maintaining electromechanical capabilities. When the sensor is printed, researchers use an air blower, basically a hair dryer, to, to get it <laughs> an to air set. Air blower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh huh. And then they, uh, and also they use it to remove some moisture that is used uh, to, to uh, as a solvent for this sort of ink that they're using. <clears throat> Shank says, the outcome is profound. We don't need to rely on heat to sinter. The, and so what this basically means is they can print onto your skin a sensor. These sensors, what do they do? These sensors are, are capable of uh, precisely and continuously capturing temperature, humidity, blood oxygen levels, uh, heart performance signals. Uh, and they also have linked the sensors to a network with wireless transmission capabilities to monitor this combination of signals from remote. Uh, process, he says, is also environmentally friendly. Uh, it can handle pretty tepid water for a few days even. A hot shower will remove it, and you can actually take it off and reuse it uh, because it doesn't just fall apart. It kind of, I guess, peels hmm. off like a big sticker. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So, okay, wait, so it's a big sticker. So help a colorblind girl out here. Um, is this person's <laughs> hand like super angry looking? Like, does it look irritated, like kind of red? So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, On that photo, that person uh, looks like the, almost like their thumb is backlit. Like the, the, there would be light coming through it. It's that red, but um yeah, and then I, you kind of see like an outline where it's not so red near the circuit, but not on the circuit. But I'm wondering if that's the actual, that's the part that peels off maybe. Yeah, I, I think this might have to be to do with how they uh, took the photo. But you're absolutely right. It could be that they were, this was like the early trial back when it was still <laughs> 100 degrees Celsius and it no, burned really. the heck out of their hand. No, no, no. When they applied it on your... the... <laughs> We are going to cook you and the sensors. Yeah, so they, they're sort of playing with this, but you can uh, you can imagine perhaps that this would be a uh, an interesting sort of interface. Then, if you can have it yeah. uh, remote uh, converse with somebody else's body sensors, I don't know 
how you would actually use this other than monitoring somebody in a way that you already could. But of course, this is the baby step of showing proof of concept. Uh, and these are very big looking uh, circuits that they have printed on this person's skin in this picture, at least. But as we talk about heading to a future where we are going to be more integrated with computers and technology, wouldn't it be nice to have a human machine interface that didn't require them drilling wires into your brain? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be... That's what, that's what I was thinking. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the idea of if you can do what you need to do by just putting it on the surface, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> sounds fantastic. Uh, moving on from from basically henna tattoos of electronics, let's talk about fluorescent bears. I want to talk about fluorescent bears. Fluorescent Those are like bears, bears that really like raves. That are no, is this like, is this tardigrades? It's tardigrades. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it's this through. Tardigrades. It's little water bears. Indian scientists, and this is scientists in India, were uh, looking for water bears, tardigrades, all over their university campus, the Ind Indian Institute of Science. And they were looking for new species. And they brought a whole bunch of water bears back into the lab. They wanted to see what happened, and they had a UV germicidal lamp and they irradiated the bears with the UV light and a whole bunch of them died. A whole bunch of them were like, I don't want to take that. And they died. Except for these reddish hued bears. And when they put them under uh, UV light, they discovered that what happens is they have fluorescent proteins somewhere under their quote-unquote skin that take the UV light and convert it into non-damaging radiation. So they fluoresce and get rid of a whole bunch of the energy from the UV light, thus protecting themselves from the damage that UV can normally cause to little organisms and humans. So new species of tardigrade... <coughs> Hi, Sadie. New species of tardigrade. And she's just so excited. <laughs> <laughs> she loves the tardigrades. It's okay. New species and a new mechanism of protection by these little bears. So they fluoresce blue, which is very exciting. Is there any chance that the fluorescent part is not just a byproduct of being UV resistant? Oh, that it, uh, may, I, they don't know much about these organisms at this point in time, um, but they do, they just know that they have these fluorescent pigments. And so now the, I guess the question is, where did it come from? Why did it get there? We don't know. Because there's lots of aquatic things that fluoresce. Yes. So it just seems like an interesting coincidence. Yeah, I mean, it could be that it happens to protect them from UV, but it uh, it's very interesting, especially when we're starting to think about how to uh, protect organisms in outer space, if this is a, an additional mechanism of protection. Yeah. So anyway, the scientists think it's likely that they evolved. Okay, here, here it says they think it's likely that the tardigrades evolved fluorescence as a way to tolerate the high UV doses that are typical in southern India. But what if they were also trying to communicate with each other? No, no, no. You, I think what everybody's is, got it wrong. Everybody they don't so think much, it's communication. There's, there's so much water. It's like, where's the other time? Oh, One word. <laughs> Tardigrades. Heart of raves. Heart of raves. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> if you just tuned in, you are listening to or watching This Week in Science. If you are interested in helping the show out, please head over to twist.org and take a look at our Zazzle store. We have a lot of products with the Twist logo and also that involved Blair's art from her 
annual calendar, which will be coming out soon. Woo-woo! Calendars are coming. Uh, and you can go to Zazzle, our Zazzle store, by going to twist.org and buy some of our merchandise and help us out, help support Twist. All right, it's time for the COVID update. <laughs> With over one million deaths internationally, <sighs> and the U.S. now reporting about 650 to 700 COVID-19 deaths daily, the virus continues to spread around the world. Interestingly, due to safety concerns, AstraZeneca has not yet restarted its Phase 3 vaccine trial. Johnson & Johnson paused its trial this week, and Eli Lilly has paused its antibody trial. And as a reminder, this is okay. This is how clinical trials work. And we shouldn't let, shouldn't let politics or media get our hopes up about treatments before they have been fully tested and vetted for safety. I feel like this should help encourage people to know that it's going through the right due diligence mm -hmm. and that it's not getting pushed through. Because this normal, this happens all the due time. Due diligence, right? yes. So like, so trials will stop when somebody has a bad reaction. You have to kind of assess it, figure out why, figure out if there's a high probability of it happening again, restart it again, know to monitor for these new things, right? So this is normal. So. This is actually really good because it means that things are working like they're supposed to. Yeah. And and there's they're not they're not barreling ahead through normal processes. Right. So so there was a nervous moment when out of the entire uh, cocktail of treatments that the president was was given, he was like, I think it all came down to this Regeneron. This one drug, this Regeneron, 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 I think that was the one that did it. Can't tell. I took like eight things, but I th I'm pretty sure that's the one that was responsible. I think that's the one. And it I turns think out so. that, yeah, and it turns out that they, uh, I guess the owner or CEO of that, whatever, uh, is a big donor. Of course. The head of the Regeneron said, very responsibly, I must say, said, uh, he's a test case of one off. With a bunch yeah. of other things, that's not evidence that our thing works yet. Yeah. Okay, he he actually They're doing took the, the trials. Yeah, and, and the president was like, "Ready? I'm going to, to, to take some of the government budget and just buy that for everybody." And the head of that company is like, "Hold on, wait, Good. wait. We have actual work to do. <laughs> Let's yeah. do that." Yeah, which I thought was uh, very responsible and very great to know that there are adults. Still involved in the process. Yes, yes. <laughs> there, are some, there are some adults in the room. Oh, yeah. <sighs> All right. Speaking of, um, not, not of rooms. Yes. Speaking of rooms, the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has that's that's a big question about what what kinds of environments it spreads most easily in. Uh, where it is most viable. Big question. A new study came out in uh, Nano Letters. Researchers looked at different environments that could potentially hold the virus cooler, more humid environments to warmer, drier environments, trying to get an idea of how the virus would stay lofted in the air and how far it would spread. They found that Cooler, more humid environments enhance the virus's ability to spread as droplets, whereas warmer air might favor aerosols. And the results suggest this is why we potentially saw a continued spread during the summer, because the aerosol transmission, as droplets dry up, the little particles of the virus continue to stay lofted in the air, maybe within that smaller range of one to two meters. Um However, their results suggest that in those cooler, more humid environments, the droplets in the humid air stay lofted much, much longer and may travel a much greater distance, up to six meters from a source. And is so this, is this also and, why flu season is in the winter? It's probably similar, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that they're thinking from this study of air of the virus in the air is that this might explain a lot of the transmission at meatpacking plants because oh, of the refrigerated geez. rooms. The refrigerated rooms are really cool and humid 
to keep the meat fresh, right? And so it may be the perfect environment for droplets to stay lofted or to travel the farther distance. And so maybe their their final suggestion is that with this information, we might be better prepared to look at different environments and do very specific precautions in different environments based on whether or not we expect more droplet or aerosol spread. So, so st- I mean, th- which is important, and I and it, that's that's good. Um, however, the entire conversation around aerosolization and the different little precautions that we can make here and there to make adjustments still reminds me of the only times which you two are too both too young to remember where you would have a non-smoking section of a restaurant right that would end here and then the next table right (laughs) would be the smoking section and all the way back at the very back of the non-smoking section you could smell cigarette smoke Mm -hmm. you were inhaling cigarette smoke it didn't matter because it travels through the air because air moves it's not just where the sneeze goes the air hovers so, like, we need to think of all of these conditions of social distancing and everything else in terms of if there's a smoker in the room, right? you're going to smell the cigarette smoke, which means you're going to inhale the virus. It's going to travel essentially in the same pathways as that. So, so for all the but little is- mitigate... Yeah, I was just going to say that the difference, though, is that so smoke is more of an aerosol. Right. And and droplets are going to be different, and so that's what this this study is specifically addressing: is that there's there is a difference in how the air, uh, uh, how it how it affects the travel of the virus, how the movement and the transmissibility of the virus. So I actually I see this as good news, if I may, because I've been kind of freaked out about what the winter is going to do to COVID because. Even people who are trying to be responsible but are still being social are doing it outside. Hopefully, most of them, at least in California right now. But anyway, you know, so that's part of it, right? Is like people can be outside. And when the winter comes and it's cold, people are going to come inside for their social events. But what we know about cloth masks is that they're pretty good at keeping droplets from moving back and forth. Not great at moving, at keeping the aerosol. So if it's getting colder, but that's going to force people inside, but people are going to wear masks while they're inside, then actually this is kind of good to hear because it means that despite people maybe getting closer together, if it's cold, then the masks might actually do a better job at preventing spread. Right. If it's cold. If you, if you, yeah, I guess if you crank up the heater, it's not, yeah, it's <laughs> so, a fair right. point. So, so don't turn yeah. on the heater. If you're going to keep it cold, keep it everybody, here, make everyone wear a coat inside. Just, yeah. So, like, really big buildings, like uh, large, large uh, things, venues, um, malls, a big Office mall, building, right? a big walking mall, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, they stop running any sort of air movers mm-hmm. in the winter. To keep it warm because they actually heat themselves by human body temperature just walking through with so many humans walking around that they so just that's enough humid. to contain the heat. Yeah. <laughs> but that just also means that no fresh air is moving through. Mm-hmm. Like there's no solution to to outside of stop. Mm-hmm. That's still yeah. the solution. Yeah, stop. Listen, I feel like the crazy person. And if you can't stop, keep your distance. Try and keep as much distance as possible. Stay outside if you can. But if you can't, wear a mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, minimize your time indoors. And if you've had contact with someone who's been sick, then quarantine yourself. Yeah. (laughs) We're going into month 10. Yeah. If we take six weeks... I know. Back you in say this Jan- every week. March. But it's still true every week. It's not but it's not didn't. stopped being true or necessary or the thing we all need to do. Well, perhaps in the new year. One thing that people have started doing is washing their hands more. There is data out through the CDC this week that uh, there was a survey of people to see whether or not messaging about hand washing has changed people's behavior. And apparently... 
pandemic is having people wash their hands more, except for people who were involved in the food or health industries because mm. they were already they were washing already. their hands a lot. <laughs> Those are there are two things I really hope that we keep from this pandemic. One is people properly washing their hands. And the second is people wearing a mask when they're sick. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. three, no handshakes. Just, just knock it off. Yeah, we could yeah. lose the handshakes for sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of wearing masks, more data is out from another location. Again, CDC this week uh, released data from Arizona that supports the use of social distancing measures to control the spread of COVID-19. Definite correlation with mask mandate measures and the reduction of deaths and cases in Arizona. And then my final story related to CDC data is... Uh, Basically, if we want to predict future outbreaks and how they're going to affect older populations, we need to look at the young people first. Data suggests that uh, throughout the pandemic, gr when groups of young people between 0 to 18 and 18 to 25 years of, old, years of age uh, start getting COVID-19 then and testing positive for COVID-19, then within a few weeks, you start to see numbers rise in elderly populations. So there is a link between younger populations to older populations. And so the whole argument that we should just take people who are going to get sick and make them stay home and just keep those people out of regular circulation, it doesn't that doesn't fly. It's not going to work because this thing spreads. And we've talked before. About asymptomatic spread, so and pre-symptomatic spread. So, <sighs> Justin, do you want to save your COVID stories? Do you have a COVID? Yeah, yeah, stories? those are second happy stories. They're not actually COVID is in the title, okay. but they're not actually about the COVID itself. Oh, I got to get through a shout out real quick to uh, Earl Chen in the YouTube chat room, who's just catching up. And yes, what's that show with the whistling? Yes, the Andy Griffith show. Mm -hmm. Yes, that if the Andy Griffith was the image of policing. In America, I think we'd have a lot less aggressive uh, <laughs> policing. There would be more yeah. hijinks, though, I think. Hijinks? What's that, Andy? Yeah. Oh, hey, Andy. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Instead, we got all Barney Fife. Yeah, maybe, that's, yeah. maybe that was the problem. Yeah, right. We got all these problem. guys who are loading that one bullet. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh everyone. This is This Week in Science. If you, if you want to help Tris, Twist, Twist, what is the name of the show? Twist. If you uh, want to help Twist grow, <laughs> get a friend to subscribe today. Oh, Blair. Yes. I think it's your turn. It's I my think. Turn. I wait. Hold on. I can't start yet. <laughs> hold on. Nope. Wait. I think I hear something. Do I hear something in my computer? Is it speaking to me? Is it saying something? Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Blair's Animal Corner. Oh, I have a lovely story sent to me by a fan of the show, uh, Justin Jackson, <laughs> um, about uh, gut bacteria in uh, in bees. Uh, yeah, no, actually, I, I texted Justin earlier today, asked if he found any good animal stories, and uh, sent this right over. It was a winner. Um, so this is this is a very appropriate uh, wait, story wait. for. Why yeah. are you texting Justin for oh, animal stories? It's, it's, uh, there's a whole story. Remember how last week Justin was like, I didn't find very much. I was like, I found so much stuff. I had that problem this week. I only okay. found a few that were interesting. I was like, that's so <laughs> funny. I'm having the opposite experience this week. He ah, sent me this right away. So very anyway, good. anyway. Uh, so this is a very appropriate story for Justin to have sent in because it's about bee microbiomes. <laughs> so um, we know that something really important to honeybees is being able to tell who is a part of their, their group and who is not. Um, because it turns out with honeybees, um, there are uh, 
kind of intruder bees, <laughs> other honeybees that will come in in the fall when plants stop producing nectar and everyone's kind of stored up all of their honey for the winter. And they will rob other colonies of their honey. And if they're able to come in and rob honey, then they will go back to their own nest and say, hey, they're really bad at guarding their honey over there. <laughs> Oh, no. go raid their place so then they'll just raid this other uh beehive and that beehive will end up starving if they can't make it through the winter so there's a lot of pressure to be able to have proper bee bouncers as i think of them to be able to tell who belongs in the hive and who does not and so for a very long time the assumption was that this was all based on uh, cuticular hydrocarbons or CHCs in their skin that had a particular chemical signal. This is true. However, the, the thought was that this was based in their genetics because all of the bees in a colony are related. But this new study finds that their CHC profile is actually dependent on their microbiome. So their gut microbial community is something that impacts the hydrocarbons in their skin, which then impacts the chemical signals, the smell, I guess, of the bee that indicates whether they belong there or not. So they have specifically colony specific microbiomes. Wow. So not genetic. It's not bugs. genetic. It would make sense that their microbiome would share because yeah. if I may just remind everyone... <laughs> How do honeybees pass nectar from one another throughout the colony? Oh, that's right. They store it in their honey crop and then they regurgitate it into another bee's mouth. That makes sense. Then mm -hmm. <laughs> they do that over and over until they're closer to the honeycomb and that's where it gets barfed up for storage. So honey is vomit that has been vomited many times over and over. Mm, You're welcome, everyone, sipping your morning tea. Okay, Next so I want to go put some in my tea right now. Mm, back honey. to it. Uh, so if they're sharing this, this food, they're barfing into each other's mouths, they're going to share a microbiome. So that tracks. Yep. Um, and so this is interesting, though, because it impacts a signal that then impacts behavior. So the microbiome is key to how the colony as a whole functions, how they maintain defense, and it does so much more than just their immune system. Um, so they they also found, looking into this, they, they wanted to try to figure out, drill down to the genetics of what changes their skin components and all this kind of other stuff. But they also wanted to see behaviorally how the microbiome impacts these things other than uh, just their genetics. So um, they, they actually develop different scent profiles as they age which I think is really interesting. So when they're younger, they the gatekeepers have a tough time. They can't always let them back in, the bee bouncers. But once they've been out into the world, their microbiome changes quickly and their scent changes quickly. So it, it's the colony microbiome, but it's also being impacted by the outside world where the nest is. But this is where it gets interesting. If you grow a honeybee in isolation, it never develops a complete microbiome. And so it really, it, they need each other and they need the outside world to get these chemical signals. But they also then took honeybees from different colonies and swapped them as babies. <laughs> and when they raised a group of newly hatched bees in either their own colonies or their unrelated colonies, that they saw actual um, microbial community crossover. So it's it's nature and nurture as always <laughs> it's both so the microbial community is impacted by the locality of the colony the conspecifics in the colony and then also by the environment and somewhat by their genetics it's all of it mm -hmm. it's all of it um so they found 14 microbial taxa that were different between these different treatments, if they were uh, raised individually, if they were raised in a colony, if they were raised in individual in a different colony, six were similar between bees that shared the same hive environment when they grew up, regardless of their genetics. So basically, they found these 14 microbial taxa in the microbiome, and six of that 14 was solely based on which colony they were raised in. 
So that has a huge impact on their signaling to their community. They, they basically, they then tried to put them back where they belonged and they were unrecognizable. They were not allowed back in the call. You wow. can't come back home. Yeah. yeah. Who are you? I don't know who you are. Yeah, this looks like a fake BID. You're not getting in. Exactly. Uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. You made this at Kinko's. <laughs> You're from one of those <laughs> other colonies. You're here to steal our honey. No, this I live here. Mm, yeah. I don't think. So add it oh, to the list to of things the that the, the microbiome does that just has impact on animal lives. It's interesting because this is a very social species, how the mm-hmm. microbiome biome is involved in that sociality. Uh, I wonder how I wonder if it has uh, influence on recognition in other insect species mm-hmm. that are not as social. Yes. And then also, because- does it have an impact on, I don't know, like naked mole rats and how they recognize each other? Yeah. Anybody that has a chemical cue involved, which is basically all of animals. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can't smell it, you could have a hormonal response to a, to any sort of chemical reaction, chemical signal, whatever. So yeah, I I think it's, we're likely to see microbial influence on a lot of things, but we also know that in humans, microbes influence um, hormones that can influence behavior, and so much, microbes can influence yeah. our brain and all this kind of. So you know, it's a, we're just we're just bacterial buses, basically. <laughs> we're, Me, we're just driving them around. Um, so, <laughs> moving from uh, bees helping each other and recognizing each other to ants helping each other. This is a very cooperative animal corner today, especially with those birds earlier in the show. So ants, uh, in particular, black imported fire ants, which I learned all about when I was doing some research for this story. They are a type of fire ant originally from South America, but they were accidentally introduced into the United States around the 1930s. They think through the port of Mobile, Alabama, Alabama, and it was probably in soil used for ships, ballasts, uh, ballast water. It's usually the reason for a lot of important uh, introduced species. But anyway, black imported fire ants in the United States, uh, they, they have been studied for their ability to um, kind of adapt to living in a watery environment. And so um, they can swim, they can create rafts. We've we've talked about how ants can kind of cooperate to make rafts and stuff like that. Um, But this is a new form of what could be considered tool use in an invertebrate. So when provided with small containers of sugar water, in this case, they were little, it looks like bottle caps of sugar water. When provided with that, and they would just kind of use the surface tension to go down to the water, grab some, and then come back to the colony to bring the the sugar water back but when they used when they they used a um a surfactant i think it was um to yeah the surfactant to destroy the the surface tension then ants just started drowning in the sugar water and their response was to use sand to create kind of a ramp out of the water and then to move the sand, create a path of sand down off the side so that they could use it to cur- to kind of create a gradient to move the sugar water quickly and efficiently out of the container towards where they're trying to move the sugar water to. Engineering ant. Wow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they, they responded to an unusual stimuli you're not often going to come across water that doesn't have surface tension in the wild so they responded to that unusual stimuli by kind of improvisation engineering i don't know what you want to call it but they were able to kind of build a structure that did what they needed and so we're showing a video right now where you can actually see how first you just see a lot of ant death which is very sad (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you just see a lot of ants going in and getting stuck. Yeah, and then death. they start to kind of gather around and recognize the issue and then start collecting sand, putting some into the cap and then the rest kind of up the side to create a ramp. And then as time continues, they create, it looks 
it kind of looks like an aqueduct, I'll be honest, uh, when they're done with it. it re it's impressive. I, I'm not sure human toddlers would figure this out. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's it pretty looks cool. like crystal growth or something though the very yeah. organic nature of how it's being built totally yeah is you know there's obviously some kind of instruction they see they seem like little i don't know little computer bits that they have their they have their instruction they're following their instruction and they are you know f make, making a program go making a program yeah. run but yeah. What's also interesting yeah. is you can, this is like high speed, uh, what do you call it? Uh, time lapse yeah. uh, imagery showing the this uh, being built. You can, in this, you can really pick out the loafer ants. Because <laughs> all the ants are sort of here, then they're gone. They're, just, they're moving around so fast. And then every once in a while, there's an ant that's just there through well, it all. Maybe they almost drowned. Maybe mm -hmm. they need they need a tick. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they need to catch their breath. Um, so after five minutes, they actually siphoned almost half of the sugar water out of these little oh, containers. Wild. And they never observed structures like this from ants when there wasn't surfactant in the water, when the surface tension was good enough for them. So they, so they think this is a pretty sophisticated tool use. But they also think it's interesting because it recognizes increased risk and adjustment based on that risk. So sure, quite a few ants died, but then they were like, guys, we can't just keep sending them in there. We gotta, we gotta adapt a strategy. Um, so of course this suggests that ants and other social insects may have considerable high cognitive capabilities, which <gasps> yeah, of course, sure. Um, surprise, no. animals are smart. <laughs> I don't, I don't agree that they have high cognitive cap capabilities but i mean we've seen from swarm robots and other you know just simple programs that complexity can can emerge from simplicity so very simple very simple instructions can lead to something like this emerging from it so i think the uh the the connotation of cog cognitive cognitive abilities is it's a bit much on my side of things. But okay. But then again, foraging like, strategies. Sure. <laughs> okay. But let's take, let's take a very advanced piece of human technology, whatever it is. Uh, pick something, anything. A pencil. Okay. <laughs> Google. Google. All right. Is there an individual human that really can comprehend and fully understand all the implications, aspects and the building of, and the, you know, is, do we, does any one individual have the higher cognitive ability to really fully conceptualize, implement, right, utilize, whatever? Right, the back whatever? end of Google. I can ask, yeah. I can, I can query no. Google, but I don't know the back end. Yeah. It's many, many, many individuals yeah. moving their little grain of sand along mm -hmm. <laughs> in programming and coding and, and yeah. it, that makes the thing uh, that looks like such a high cognitive, high thing. So, I mean... I can see how you might anticipate that just a lot of ants would die and then they'd be like, forget it. This is too hard. Oh yeah, just walk away. Just walk away. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're like, let's yeah. overcome an obstacle. Let's do this. Go team. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't look like they continue to lose ants at a certain point. It's like right. the first round yeah. dies and then they've come up with a workaround. So yeah, I, I wouldn't underestimate how, them. How many ants does the colony allow to die before they give up? You know, Good what is question. the what is the genetic program, the limitation for risk I to the colony? feel like we've this has come up before. Yeah. And, and it actually, I think the answer was in those ants that I was noticing who aren't doing anything, who obviously right. aren't helping. Yes. Um, <laughs> ant colonies have uh, a, a large ants. contingent of yeah. lazy ants. Yeah, yep. the lazy ant story. Which is just in case this direction we've decided to go down all turns out to be a, a spider ant trap or, yeah. or something like that, you know. <laughs> like, let's, uh, some of us should just chill. Just don't work chill too hard out. today. We might yep. need you later. Yeah. Yeah. We might. Well, we can all take inspiration from those ants. Let's stick with it, everybody. Everyone push their little grain of sand.
We'll be and fine. And if what you're doing isn't working, maybe try something new. <laughs> Yeah, group maybe think. try something new. Yeah. Yes, cooperation uh, <laughs> apparently is as good as being cognitive. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really time. actually what it's about, right? Is that yeah. one ant by themselves probably wouldn't figure this out. So, but the group, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Hey, everyone! Calendars are coming. That's right. Get yourself ready for the Blair's Animal Corner twists. 2021 calendar links will be available soon. Get your hypnotoad. Link will be at twist.org. Thank you for listening to Twists. You are the reason that we're able to do what we do every single week. You're the reason that we have the support that we need to make this show go forward. But we can always use more and to be able to do more and bring you more, to be able to produce what we produce better. And with your support, we can bring more science to more people. So if you would like to support Twists, please head over to twist.org, click on the Patreon link, and choose your level of support, $10 a month and above. You'll be thanked by name at the end of the show. Thank you for your support. We really cannot do this without you. And we're back. We're back. Yeah, we're back again, fans. I'm I'm saying that for those of you who are listening to the podcast because Blair is fanning herself. I am. It's, it's hot warm. In San, it's hot in San Francisco. All right, let's talk about some evolution. Let's talk about a really cool study that I found this week that just kind of made me stop and go, what? This is so neat. Researchers at EMBL Heidelberg. EMBL is the European Microbiology La Molecular Biology Laboratory. They have been looking at the expression pattern of proteins in fruit flies. And the expression pattern of proteins in fruit flies is dictated by the transcription translation of genes. Those genes are regulated by what are called enhancers, little bits of DNA, microRNA, little sequences that get in there and either tell the transcription mechanism to do more, 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 and upregulate and make lots of protein, or to make less, or to start at a different place, or stop at an earlier location. So these enhancers really change the way that transcription and then protein expression actually occurs. And it's kind of been thought that enhancers, they influence biodiversity, but exactly how influential they are has been underestimated. So these researchers at EMBL, they got together with a group at Janelia Research Campus and the Advanced Light Microscopy Facility at EMBL to build a robot. They built a robot that was responsible for taking care of little baby fly embryos. So you have a robot managing the fly embryos that are being developed in the study and automating a microscope pipeline to take little images of the little mutated, f little mutated flies <laughs> as they're developing. So basically they, had, they built a robot scientist to do the study for them. <laughs> but in the study, it really could only be done now with the technology that we have because of the high throughput nature of this study. They created more than 700 completely unique, randomly generated mutations within a single enhancer that goes and affects a gene. So these 700 mutations, they are very specific point mutations in these little sequences of DNA that then go tell the tell proteins how to be expressed. 
what they found is that it was basically like watching evolution take place. The researcher, Timothy Fuqua, graduate student working on the study, says our study shows that what we have known about enhancers was oversimplified. It shows we have to study enhancers in much greater detail than ever before. They were able to find um, that even simple point mutations. They said, whenever we changed a single letter of the enhancer DNA sequence, we created a significant change to the pattern of gene expression that it drove. We also found that almost all mutations to the enhancer alter the gene expression pattern in multiple ways. For example, one mutation controls not only where the expression pattern is within the fly, but also when and how much of the gene is expressed. And so looking very deeply at how these enhancers affect the the distribution of proteins um, in the fruit fruit fly um, has is starting to lead to some really interesting understanding of of not just fruit fly development but how genes are regulated during development and how these enhancers play a role in that um, but it's just really interesting to think about you know, changing one mutation at a time. They also found that certain mutations were likely to have happen with uh, with certain probabilities. And so they really were playing evolution. They were doing little randomized mutations to see what they did. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just in flies, but... Uh, we start with our fly models and our robot scientist and eventually move up to see how some of the things that we learn there affect uh, genetics at a more complex level in mammals. But this also gives us insight into what happened before we got here, how evolution even, you know, what is the raw material for evolution, right, for natural selection? What is that raw material? Um, and speaking of selection, let's move on to my posit my what did, what did I what did I call it? The the negative, negative positive, positive the negative yeah. positive selection. <laughs> Possible <laughs> negative positive selection. Yes. Possibly negative. Yes, researchers publishing in Cell this week have uh, published a study. Looking in the uh, looking in the genome at uh, this particular gene locus two Q two one point three, sound familiar to anyone? No. Okay, this <sighs> locus is the gene that holds, or this is the the gr the genetic sequence that holds the gene for lactase. This is the <laughs> locus responsible for our ability to digest milk. Some people got it and some people don't, but it has been very positively selected for since the advent of ranching cows, of starting to drink milk in a more dietary sense when we became less nomadic and, uh, and settled down. So over several thousand years, it has rapidly spread through a large proportion, especially of northern European descent individuals, and has positively positively influenced that aspect of digestion now and of course the it, this, uh, this is the the natural selection uh of the past that i believe took place which is everybody started drinking milk and they slowly pushed out those that became flatulent as a result Right. Yes. Very slowly. You just sleep outside. Yeah. Very you slowly. Go That's outside. Who got not getting into the long house. <laughs> who got eaten? All right. So they looked at uh, they looked at this particular uh, at this particular locus of gene sequence, and additionally looked at what else is involved in this locus, what else is associated with it. And they found a microRNA called microRNA 128-1, myR 128-1. Now, it's located in the center of this positively selected locus. It's a metabolic regulator. It's very important for metabolism in mammals. <sighs> 
So a bunch of experiments showed that uh, it's it's important for uh, the ability to digest fat and also for glucose tolerance. And what they show in this study is that, oh, it's connection to the positive selection for lactase has also potentially linked it to an overabundance of obesity and glucose intolerance in mammals. So and it it's may not from be just drinking the milk. This not is just another genetic factor that is being co-selected for that is negative. Yes. So it's negative um Yes, that's exactly it, that it has negative effect, effects. And so the fact that it has been dragged along means that it is increasing rates of obesity and uh, and diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, and that it could be involved in that. And it might be this microRNA, not necessarily the gene itself, but the microRNA could be a target for uh, for treatment for some of these things. And in a mouse model, when they uh, changed, they uprated, regulated this microRNA, they increased obesity and insulin resistance in the mice, downregulated the microRNA. Uh, they led to decreased obesity and decreased insulin resistance, glucose tolerance. Um, so it, the microRNA is very important. It's been dragged along, positively selected for. Um, and it's just an example of things that kind of co-evolve because they're in the same associated locus of genetic information in our DNA. So the good sometimes comes with the bad. And we, it's interesting to kind of unravel that as we move forward. Yeah, and it also is another reason I feel bad for for folks who have studied and written books on nutrition. You know, it's one of those like because the correlation may have been there. You know, drinking milk it might be associated with the higher risk of diabetes. Oh, so you should stop drinking milk. Eh, it has nothing to do that with ha- whether you drink milk or not no. because it's already in the genes, yes. dragged along from thousands of years of selection. Yes. Yep, it's already in there. Yeah. So anyway, a lot of interesting genetic stuff that super fun, super fun. But it is time for your stories, Justin. Yeah. Speaking about what the did you super fun. Bring? Yeah. Uh, published in the Royal, uh, the General Royal Society Open Science, scientists from the University of Cambridge gathered data from five different countries: the UK, the United States, Ireland, Mexico, and Spain. And they have identified how much traction some prominent COVID conspiracy theories have gotten within these populations. <laughs> and the results are alarming, if not entirely unsurprising. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me go through this list here. COVID-19 was engineered in a lab in Wuhan, China despite the fact that there's no evidence within the genome of this virus having been altered in any way, and it appears in nature in several other forms that have already been found deadly, and Southeast Asia is always pretty much where viruses emerge due to the biomes and the uh, population density. More than half of the humans on the planet live there in dense conditions, so things tend to, um, if there's a communicable disease, it's going to make it through the population there quicker than it will anywhere else. Still, between 22 and 23 respondents in the UK and the United States rated the conspiracy reliable. What? Wait, 20, Ireland, 22 to 23 percent? Of UK and United okay. States uh, rated it reliable that COVID-19 was engineered in a lab in Wuhan, China. In Ireland, that became 26%. Mexico, 33%. Spain, 37%. <sighs> okay. So uh, that's, there's that. Um, but, it was, but it was created uh, as part of a nefarious plot to enforce global vaccination, <laughs> despite the fact that there isn't one in place to enforce. Right, 22% right. of Mexican population rated this as reliable, along with 18% in Ireland, Spain, and the UK. 
uh, as well, oh, sorry, 18% uh, in Ireland, Spain, and the US, only 13% in the UK found that credible. That's still a very high number. So Double dude, these are all very good. extreme numbers. Yeah. 5G telecommunication towers are actually causing a virus or at least worsening COVID-19 symptoms because that is how nature and physics conspire to to uh, uh, to harm low information people. Uh, 16% in Mexico, 16% in Spain, 12% Ireland, 8% in both the UK and US rated that as reliable. Yeah, so this is uh, Dr. Sander van der Linden, co-author and director of the Cambridge Social Decision-Making Lab. Certain misinformation claims are consistently seen as reliable by substantial sections of the public. We find a clear link also between believing coronavirus conspiracies and hesitancy around any future vaccines, as well as Flagging false claims, governments and technology companies should explore ways to increase digital media literacy in the population. Otherwise, developing a working vaccine might not be enough. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a kind of a fun thing that they've created uh, previously. It's the in the social decision making lab. They have a project called Go Viral, which you, I, the way I had to Google it went Go Viral UK. Uh, you could also put in social decision making lab that should also help you find it. It's a short sort of online choose your own adventure game that uh, teaches you how to be a, a misinformation, disinformation, social media um, troll. No, <laughs> no. But, but it shows you how quickly and easily these things can propagate in this sort of game environment. Um, yeah, and yeah. you can get a score to see how nefarious you were uh, and compare it to your friends. I actually did pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I believe that. So so some of the interesting things here, uh, they had as part of the survey a, a numeracy or a math test, uh, some math tasks that they, they gave their respondents first before they went on with the, the declaring things and levels of trust. Um, if, if they scored high in the math skills, they were significantly and consistently uh, less likely to be susceptible to false information. And this was across all nations. Being good at just basic math, which by yeah. that, it almost indicates that people who are believing in conspiracy theories are bad at math. They can't mm. logic or add mm, somehow the... Uh, well, I mean, it's part of the, like, if you say, like, 80%, of the 50%, of the 25%, of the 10% yeah. of people have reported these symptoms from this situation. It's like, okay, so once you add all those things, okay, it's actually like one person is what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and so that's <laughs> going to come up again uh, in just a second. So uh, being older, being older, uh, okay, boomer, actually was linked Not to lower so susceptibility. Lower su susceptibility lower. to COVID-19 misinformation in all nations, except for Mexico, where it was actually averse. The young people were less susceptible to yeah. it than the old. Uh, identifying as more right-wing, politically conservative, was associated with higher likelihood of believing COVID-19 conspiracies and falsehoods in Spain, Mexico, and Ireland, but not in the U.S. and the U.K., it was, uh, it was, which I find found surprising, seeing as how there seems to be this left-right issue of mask wearing in the United mm -hmm. States. It seems the conspiracy theories seem like a huge part of uh, right-wing talking points and theology right now, or, or ideology right now. But, but maybe that's the eighty percent of the fifty percent of the twenty percent of the four percent of the kind of a thing. It might be that even though these are proliferating in the media, all of these views from the right wing in this country, the actual beliefs of people don't reflect that, and that those ideals are actually fringe thinking in the United States, as they don't even show up as a blip in this survey, at least. Uh, trusting that politicians can handle the crisis predicted a higher likelihood of buying into conspiracies in Mexico, Spain, and the United States. So the more you trust the government to handle it, the more you also believe in the conspiracy theories, which is interesting since it, at least one of them, I think, it sounds like it's a government conspiracy. Um, 
But UK and Ireland, this was not true. Uh, social media was linked to misinformation susceptibility in Ireland, UK, and the United States. They also asked participants about their attitude to a future uh, coronavirus vaccine. Found increased reliability of misinformation, meaning that they believed the misinformation was associated with the likelihood of not getting vaccinated or saying that you would not get vaccinated, as well as a decrease in the odds of someone recommending vaccination to vulnerable friends and family. Those are people who are at most most vulnerable to the coronavirus, the COVID-19. Trust in scientists was associated with an increase in the likelihood of getting vaccinated, an increase in the odds of recommending vaccines to others, and an increased uh, uh, or decrease in thinking that misinformation was reliable. Uh, so this is, now we're talking about this uh, as, as, oh, you've got the game up. Fantastic. You've, uh, we're talking about this in terms of COVID here. But there is misinformation uh, on so many levels. One of the interesting things I find about the, the Wuhan lab-created uh, virus story is this is not the first time we've heard this type of a story. There was, uh, in the 80s, mid-80s, uh, a Russian, uh, one of the uh, KGB-created story that ran in an Indian newspaper and this thing called the Patriot, it was an English newspaper in India that claimed that the United States of America had engineered the AIDS virus in order to uh, attack African Americans with. Um, it then got later, many, many years later, showed up on the nightly news in the United States and became this huge conspiracy theory, but it was intentional misinformation campaign. We are seeing so many of them uh, that seem to come from very on high that get repeated very easily with no information, with no uh, journalistic integrity, of course, with no fact checking. With uh, they, are t they sort of say that governments and social media need to take this on. I do think that there, there was a role within the United States. Um, I don't know if it was in the CIA or if it was the State Department that used to go out and counter false information that was created by these Russian uh, KGB mis disinformation programs. We need something like that within social media. I think the, the social media groups need to hire like a big team of journalists that may not be doing news, but may just be dedicated to rooting out false information. Because this is obviously, we wanna be an informed public in the first place. We like to have news. We like to have good news that we can trust, done by journalists with integrity. But at this point, in this information age, it's just as important to have journalists working full time at weeding out bad information. Because there is such a proliferation of it and it is harmful and it is dangerous and it is something that needs to be tackled. There's a, there's also apparently a, oh, I don't have it, but uh, we should, uh, I should find this. Estonia, which is a small little country. I think it's kind of near Belarus. It's very close to Russia. They, they got liberated from Russia a little while ago. They have a television show and a web, they have a, one of their most popular things that they do on television. Like Americans might tune into uh, the singing show or the, dating show or that thing that everybody talks about around the water cooler the next day. They have a show like that, that just debunks uh, Russian disinformation programs huh. that are being applied to them. <laughs> and it's like the most popular thing. Oh, what is their propaganda saying this time? Ah, here's all the facts. Here's what you need to know. Nice. Uh, and they have a website dedicated uh, to debunking it, which is also a very popular website in Estonia. Um, we need something like that, I believe, in the United States. Mm -hmm. They need it in the UK. They obviously need it in Spain and Mexico and Ireland. And that's just the countries that they looked at. They probably need, we probably need this everywhere at this point. And it should be an incorporated department within every social media company. It needs to be a department with, that our governments are actually focused on. We don't want governments in charge of our information but we do need a vetting process for all the bad information that now exists that people have access to. Uh, my last story, also a COVID story, uh, says here, well, COVID-19 poses the most immediate threat to human health at the moment. 
The first half of 2020 saw a tremendous decline in CO2 emissions. Yay! Woohoo! <laughs> Good job, yeah. pandemic. Yeah, researchers found that in the first six months of 2020, 8.8% less carbon dioxide was emitted than in that same period in 2019, uh, which is a decrease of 1,551 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In April, when major countries were in that full-on shutdown mode, emissions declined by a whopping 16.9%. Study uh, published in the is published in the latest issue of Nature Communications. Uh, and it kind of shows a couple of interesting things. Ground transportation was the greatest reduction. All the working from home, or they maybe just not having a job. Uh, CO2 emissions decreased by 40% worldwide from this sector. The power sector, energy production, was down 22%. Industry uh, uh, production of uh, CO2 down 17%. The residential sector, what do you think happened there? Up. Actually, it was down a bit too. It dropped by 3%. Uh, Interesting. (laughs) Yeah, well, (laughs) they know why. Largely because it was an abnormally warm winter in the Northern (laughs) Hemisphere. So. (laughs) Thanks People to global didn't have warming, to use their heating and energy <laughs> consumption was decreased despite the fact that people were staying at home more. Oh, no. Uh, what's also kind of cool is they, uh, they had their, these estimates were based on a wide array of data, but um, they had very precise hourly data sets because they tied it into electricity power consumption in 13 countries, daily traffic volume in more than 400 cities worldwide, daily global passenger flights, monthly production data from industry in 62 countries, fuel consumption data for, and for buildings and emissions from more than 200 countries. Uh, so they were actually able to collect this data in a sort of day by day and sometimes hourly uh, format. So they have real pictures and you know that you can sort of zoom into in, in, in a way and sort of drill down on what was going on during this week that was different from another week uh, so they could correlate it to things like weather or when the shutdown was going on, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah. Uh, despite all this, of course, I, uh, it, uh, you know, there, there was like, this is the lowest we've seen it since, uh, or the biggest decline in, uh, in, in, emissions since this event or that event or this event, it, it kind of doesn't matter because we're still at magnitudes uh, mm-hmm. of carbon. Like we're back to like, oh, this is like way back in 2008 emissions or something. It's not really like we've reversed anything. Um, so, I mean, we can, we can hope that this changes some people's relationship with a commute. In the long term, we know that's probably happening, at least in the Bay Area. I know a lot of um, big office buildings have shut down because they've discovered that productivity did not take a hit by having people work from home. They were like, we're we're working from home from now on. Like, let's turn them into condos. Yeah. So so I know that, um, you know, I hope that commute carbon emissions will stay reduced. They won't be down where they are now, but. Hopefully they won't go back up to where they were. But I also wonder if, um, especially since there's a lot of kind of bite, belt tightening happening at the very beginning of the pandemic, because everyone wasn't sure what was happening to their jobs or their income and things were very scary. If it changed people's relationship with consumption at all, you know, buying things, buying new things, throwing old things away, you know, I, I, I have hope that this maybe adjusted some people's relationship with the consumerist nature of the United States and well, for, you know the Western world in general. I think a lot of people started buying more things because they were stocking up. So. Sure, yes. But, in terms yeah. of food, I think that's true. But I think in terms of recreational spending, yeah. um, I know at least <laughs> recreational at Recreational spending was, for things that you can do at home. <laughs> yeah, things you can do at home, <laughs> things you don't need. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I know a lot of people learned how to cook for the first time in their adult life from being at home. So that might also that, help. Yeah. Rick Steves, the the P 
PBS travel, travel guy. guy. Yeah. The yeah. travel guy. He just posted something about he's learning how to cook for the first time in his life. There's nothing like the sweet sound of a knife slicing through a crisp onion. And he'd never experienced that before, apparently. Oh, apparently. Man. <laughs> you know, he's got a job in... where they pay him to travel around and eat out. I At think restaurants, I would, yeah. yeah. He's got to be really but really, you right never now. want to, like, scramble an egg for time. yourself in the morning? Whatever. Okay, fine. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But, yeah, there's a whole bunch out there. A lot of things that if we can potentially hold on to how they changed life for the better and can potentially continue to change things for the better help us all as humans live more sustainably and in mm-hmm. you know in in a more holistically sustainable manner um you know there's a lot we can do out there not just yeah. staying at home yeah yeah and change is possible it it doesn't always take a pandemic but maybe it it, it took that for us to recognize that Changes to to our our kind of our way of life is possible. Yeah, change is not only possible; it can be good. It's always hard, but yeah. it can be good. Yeah, which like you might rather do it now when you have a choice as to how and when, rather than when you have to do it, a la COVID, when things have gotten so bad from climate change that there's no choice at all. <laughs> Just yeah. a thought. Just we we all probably would have rather to have a month notice before the entire world shut down. Wouldn't that have been nice? Well, we have 50 years now. notice right now. We can do it now. Right. 50 years before Figure the it out. 50 years before the next pandemic. No, 10 years no, before the 50 next 50 years pandemic. before all and, those and in heck with climate, climate change. change is more what yeah. I meant. Well, oh. <laughs> But we could also do it uh, when it wasn't spring and nice out. You know, we can also do like, let's take uh, the uh, sort of late January through all February. And we'll just use that to, to check. <laughs> yeah, like, when pick, I want to stay I, inside and stay home anyway. Yeah, yeah, when it's like too rainy and foggy and snowing or whatever your local weather. It's Earth problem. Month. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Shouldn't that be in the spring when we're all outdoors? No, this is about us being on the Earth Month. Yes, Yes. this This is is about about respecting the Earth, letting the Earth heal, giving it back to them. Respect the the Earth Month. Yes. Respect the raccoons. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they demand it. Respect my authority. All right, everyone. I think we have made it to the end of another show. Have we done it? Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. We did it. We did it. We've done it. We've talked all about it. Thank you for being here and for being a part of it. I wanted to say thank you and give shout outs to Fada for help with show notes and show descriptions. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room and keeping that going through all the net splits and other other issues that occur. Identity 4, thank you for recording the show. And as always, thank you to our Patreon sponsors and to the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their support. Thank you to Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Stiefstad. I Wait, Please what? email me and tell me how to pronounce your name, Vegard. <laughs> Skiefstad. Vegard Skif Skif. Yep, Dad. I don't See, think you're, you're giving him better. too many shout outs. He didn't pay enough for that many. I didn't. I don't think you got. I, I don't think you're getting closer. I think you're yep. just saying the same thing over and over again. Yep, yep, sure am. So if you want me to pronounce your name correctly, maybe you know phonetic Phone- pronunciation. <laughs> Send me an email. I'm sorry. Hal Snyder, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, John Chioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Maddie Parangor of Sharma, Mark Shoemaker, Mike Shoemaker, Sarah Forfar, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Corinne Benton, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Ben Bignell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Jane Tellier, Steve Leesman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Melizond, Johnny Gridley, Flying Out, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Massaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, 
Melania is a Russian super spy. Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavez, Alex, Alex Wilson, John Ratnaswamy, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, E.O. Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul W. Stanton, Paul D. Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Rothig, Gary S., Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Jason Roberts, and Dave Friedel. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if any of you out there would like me to say random words at the end of the podcast, you too can support us on Patreon and put whatever name. I don't know what I just, I, I'm, I'm asking for it right now, aren't I? It has to be it's G-rated. A, it has to be G-rated, please. Yes. Yeah. I think there have to be limits. That's right. On next week's show, our guest will be... Josiah Zayner, he has joined us before. Oh, he nice. will join us again. We'll be back next week. I will be back next week. Blair and Justin will not. So uh, yeah, most likely. Most likely. So, Justin, even though you're not going to be here, where can everyone find us next week? Uh, next week, uh, the show will still be Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from YouTube, Facebook, and wherever else. Twist uh, is, uh, oh, twist.org slash live, if that's your preference. Or you can uh, look for us at the other places. What hey, do you other places? Li- if you, if you want to listen instead of watch, you can search <laughs> for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. So you can figure it out. You guys are smart. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. Get them to download some podcast app on their phone. They'll never know. It'll be a happy surprise. Yeah. Uh, for surprise information podcast. on anything you've heard here today, there are show notes, links to stories. You can peruse them on your own. Uh, they'll be available on our website, www.toys.org. You can also sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, into the subject line, or your email will definitely get spam filtered to the bottom of a container of sugar water with surfactant, so there will be no service tension. Sorry. And there will be lots of ants. Yeah. If uh, swimming with dead ants isn't your thing, you can also hit us up on Twitter, <laughs> where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week in spirit, but Kiki will be here for real. And we hope you join us again for more great science news. If you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. Jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in 
in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science, science, science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in science. And we're in the after show. The after show, yo. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, in the background you can see Justin's art. He's sitting in front of it during the show. It's nice to see him doing his art. It's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Blair, your calendars look so great. Mm. It's all done. It's all done. What do you have there? A I'm scanning uh, all tomorrow. What is the shoe bill? Giant. Yeah. It's a shoe bill. Know, it just look like a giant murder bird. Yeah, that's generally you know. what a shoe bill is. <laughs> that's that's the reputation. That's a it dinosaur. Has. That is that is a dinosaur. I'm looking forward to actually putting this on um a phone case in the Zazzle store. Ooh. I think it would come out really good. I think it will come out really well. Mm-hmm. I think some of the other ones will look really good on Zazzle merchandise also. Ha, uh, Shoe Brew had a funny joke, password joke in the chat room. I like this one too. Like, oh, I like that guy. This one, Giraffe Weevil, will be very giraffe good weevil. on things. And of course, nice. I gotta do a frog, always. You know I love frogs. Always a frog. Um, for la- my last day at the zoo, they named a frog after me. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Yep, Justin's back. Yeah, a smoky jungle frog is now named Blair. Nice. Wow. At the San Francisco Zoo. That's awesome. Yeah. And here in this Very exhibit, cool. you see Blair. Yes. You I'll can tell her apart Blair. from the other frogs because she is the fattest one. <laughs> <laughs> but she's the fattest because she has the the best personality so she's the best at getting to the food and stuff yeah so is, is, is it a pregnant frog or is it no uh, just a, okay just a, just a frog wings of tech wing of tech is saying last day at the zoo mm-hmm. sad face um are yeah. you at liberty to did you tell last week what you're doing? Are you no, I think tell? I should wait because I haven't had okay. my new employee orientation yet. So I don't know what their rules are for these things. But I am Great. I am changing Moving careers, on. as it were. Yeah. Yes. I'm working. I'm, I'll just Very do what I did about the zoo before. I'm moving into the parks circuit. <laughs> so Parks are nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm changing careers, careers too. Great. Yes. How's your oh, yeah. career change going, Justin? Yeah. I, well, I have no idea what it is yet. <laughs> like, I don't know what it out. is. I don't know what I'm doing. Still trying to figure that out. My, this is my mid-fall 
considering a career change because maybe my mental health would be better if I were just a completely stay-at-home mom slash teacher slash chef slash maintenance person slash (laughs) (laughs) I'm like oh god (laughs) yeah homeschooling and trying to do work it's very there's a combination of things there for sure for sure oh identity four full-time drunk I tried that. It doesn't go well. <laughs> no. no, no, no. There's a, there's a, there was a meme or a cartoon that I saw. I think it was a rabbit, and it's got all this booze next to it, and it's like, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just throwing a party. And then the next frame was post COVID. I'm not throwing a party. I'm just an alcoholic. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah. Exactly. Changing realities. That sounds great, Bruce. Bruce Cordell. Just need oh, to find a so dimensional cool. door. Yes. That careful, would be nice. Careful when you get to the other side. You just don't know. You never really know. I mean, one but... thing that I learned from the hit 90s show Sliders, you never can tell if you're yeah. going to the, the dimension where the men get pregnant instead of women, or if you're going to the dimension where aliens take your eyes out at birth. <laughs> I, I actually walked I like through such eyes. a door. I actually walked through one of those Good. doors uh, in 2019. I was like, ah, I can't take this anymore. I'm going through the dimensional door. And then I ended up in 2020. So here with the rest of you, it's, trust me, it's not, the grass may seem greener on the other side, but it might be because nobody's walking on it anymore. <laughs> yeah, so what, one, of the, one of my favorite tweets actually about this is like, uh, I think someone figured out time travel and keeps going back in time to try to fix 2020. But every time they do it, they actually create a butterfly effect and make it worse. There's, uh, there's this great, um, uh, it's probably everybody's seen it. I'm just the last one. But it's, it's, it's uh, I should find it so that I'm not just describing it and we can provide a link. But this uh, girl does this, uh, this woman does this, this amazing uh bit where it's april uh and it's uh a future her from june shows up oh yes yes and, and then i was like like i gotta tell you about what's coming it's like what what uh is the COVID? are we out yeah it's like no this is covered's nothing what do you mean oh there's a lot more going on and then so this is lets her know that like things are gonna get worse two months from now and then like august her shows up to the june her it's like wait what are you doing here Ugh. like wait what no don't tell me good news or bad news oh i can't take it and then the october one shows up and she's just smoking and she's like do are we gonna do this <laughs> like, are we gonna do this but it's the most hilarious uh uh yeah that one went viral i guess she is a great actress i thought that was like one of the most amazing bits i've seen but she's been updating i guess every two or three months with a new version of this and so <laughs> it's like so she has to like sort of break. She's about to break the Ruth Bader Ginsburg news, and then just decides it's too much. Yeah, just decides that you know what? I'm not, I'm not even going to tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to. What? What is it? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, Everything's boy. fine. Everything's just going to be fine. Oh, but that you really might want to do another Costco team, run, wasn't it? Oh my god. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody uh, somebody can find that link on I think on the YouTube's and put it into the chat rooms uh, for me because I don't uh, know what it was called or where to find it. Somebody showed it to me, but it was brilliant. Hmm. Oh, twenty twenty. Oh, explaining the pandemic to myself is the title uh. of the piece. Explaining the pandemic to myself. It is hilarious and also really only only now can we look back and see how uh, great a year it's been for yeah. all the reasons well i'm uh i'm i'm finding a way to uh enjoy the end of my 2020 good <laughs> large life events so that's helpful 
Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. You gotta work that out. Figure it out. Exactly. Blair Bazdritz isn't gonna be intimidated by a little old virus. No. No way. Mm. New job. Keep doing life. New job, who dis? New job. New husband. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. I really like Brian. No, he he's now he's gonna be my ex boyfriend because he's now gonna, gonna be, be my husband. Boyfriend. I know that's really yeah, sad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my he's, favorite podcasts. He'll be your certifiable uh, boyfriend. The host refers to his wife. He goes, "My ex girlfriend, who is now my wife." Ex girlfriend. After I got married, I kept calling Marshall my boyfriend for a very long time. I just could not switch over. <laughs> I was like, oh, we did, we, we actually did get married. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, looks like Hot Rob, Hot Rod found it. Hob Rob. Hob Rob. Hob Rob, you have found it. Hob, 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 hob. Good um, night, Noodles, Fada. get new masks, man. I... I don't use the ear masks at all anymore. I have like two of them that I use to take the dog out, but all my other masks are tie back masks. Yeah. I love them. You can They're always great. take uh, the ear masks and like cut them and, or you can add string to them and make them tie back masks. You can also take a strip of fabric, sew two buttons onto it and put it behind you. Yes. Oh, that would work too. Yeah. It has to be just the right length. Wait, you sewing buttons into the back of your head? No, no onto a strip of about... fabric. Or you could just buy um tie back masks. Uh -oh. I found one Etsy seller who I love who just does like build a callet around your ears. It's fine. You're gonna need it for a while. <laughs> Goodness, I need to go finish my taxes. Yeah, you should yeah, do that. Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go do some more wedding prep. I am. Uh... Oh my gosh. Justin's going to have a day. Justin's going to have a day. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling pretty good. nice. Everything's cold medicine so kicked in? No, I don't take cold medicine. The COVID medicine. Uh, I don't think I would admit for the show. I would be asleep uh, already. <laughs> you don't take the non-drowsy, basically, like, meth version of cold medicine? No, no. The only stuff that I have... Actually, you know what's funny? Uh, is I have the... Um, I have the cold medicine that doesn't have... The nighttime cold medicine that doesn't have the cold medicine in it. Yeah, I can't, I can't even remember what it's called, but it's the same ingredients in the drowsy cold medicine that you can take the little cup of and it helps you go to sleep at night. It's Does anybody, yeah. quill or whatever. Yes, yeah. yes, that's it. Yes. Yeah. yes, that's that's it. Mm -hmm. um, um, hot tip, just take some Benadryl. <laughs> those little pink Benadryl yeah. pills? No, but those are no, no. Uh, no, they, she's not kidding about taxes. So I'm, so I'm tax not kidding season, about it. Tax season got extended almost in, over the infinite horizon this year because they're like, we don't want your you to send. They us didn't stuff. want the People taxes. Are... Yeah, and then they and then it was you filed and then I filed an ex so it was late and then I filed mm -hmm. an extension and now this is like the last tomorrow is like the last day of the year to turn in last years taxes yeah i mean it don't just i just have to I just have to pay fees to the government if i miss otherwise i mean it doesn't really matter actually because they charge you fees they charge you interest anyway if you owe money so oh boy it honestly honestly doesn't matter but yes i have to go go add up numbers in columns right now oh, <laughs> do my taxes um eric in alaska wants to know where everyone's gonna be next week so justin will be in the air it seems like. Uh, so I have to like still do the math. I I might uh, I might stop jump in and just say hi. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll be getting uh, at least being last minute logistics trying to get to an airport. I'm going back to the U.S. of A. Coming uh, back to the U.S. Of a. It's not a great a time, Justin, to come back. Yeah, just don't. 
why. I, you got to vote. No, you didn't. I vote. have to vote. I'm coming to, to vote. vote. Is that why you're coming back? So, no, there's other reasons too, but um, like uh, you know, your the, your pro- progeny, they yeah. have to see you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, the uh, the mail-in voting thing hadn't started yet when I left, mm-hmm. and then started like pretty soon after I left. Uh, but yeah, so I got to go and, and and make sure that that happens. Nice. Um, I will be in the woods. <laughs> Um, we're doing a we're doing a mini moon we were gonna have like a legit honeymoon like do a costco vacation package go somewhere tropical but obviously can't do that right now so we're pushing that next year to our actual big wedding date doing it then hopefully fingers crossed everyone get your crap together so we can have a real wedding please thank you um and so instead we're just we're doing an airbnb in the woods for like a week because we got we got the time off anyway yeah, thanks. Mm-hmm. So trying to find the the fun where we can yeah. celebrate. Find that fun. And Gaurav, yeah, Among Us would be fun. My my son Kai would be right there leading the pack. If you wanna we we could definitely get a bunch of people on a on an Among Us server. My son would <laughs> I would be the one who's totally sus because I have no idea how to play. I have no idea. Sus. No idea to... sus. sus. That's suspect. So Among uh-huh. Us, have you ever have you did it have you ever played um, no Werewolf? Idea. Oh yeah, or Mafia. Mafia. Right? Yeah. 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 So wow. it's a okay. it's a game wow. where it's a game where two one, two, three people in the game. There are like ten of you on a spaceship. And one to three people are alien imposters who get to run around and kill people, Mm. but they have to act normal. And everyone has these tasks that they're supposed to do. But while everybody's doing the tasks, the imposters run around and try and kill people. And the goal is to figure out who the imposters are before they kill everybody and to do all your tasks. And so Mm. it's kind of like you're supposed to be paying attention to who's doing it. But I'm like running around trying to follow people. Yeah. So it actually sounds exactly like um, we have a, a board game that's uh, the thing, you know, John John Carpenter's the thing. Okay, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, that is basically that. It's a it's a cooperation based game. You're given tasks, but a certain number of people are infected, and then they can infect other people, and mm. you have to like try to figure out who it is. And yeah, that's awesome. and so yeah, your goal is to not let the alien get off of the base and into the helicopter i think we have lost every time i've played <laughs> the alien always wins um but uh it sounds I very similar get, to this i always get voted off the spaceship doesn't matter whether or not i'm an imposter <laughs> people are like you're oh, no. sus kiki whoever you are you're sus <laughs> oh, okay no. i am i don't know what i'm doing how do i get anywhere what is this map i don't know what's happening yeah, it's fun. It's become is it, a viral thing. Is it a thing. video game? Yeah, it's a it's a game okay. that went viral. That uh, yeah. once the pandemic started, people had nothing to do, and they found this game, and everybody loves it now. And it is pretty mm-hmm. fun. Cool. It's pretty fun, and I accept my susness. Mm-hmm. Suspicious. That's right, Thunder Beaver. Yes. Yeah, but Blair, you can go shout in the woods. I will. will do my taxes. Is there anything else going on? Today is Fossil Day. Happy Fossil Day. Isn't today also Ada Lovelace Day? Yesterday. No. Yesterday. Yesterday. And on Friday, we all need to watch Hamilton because it's Hamilton Day. Hmm. Just listen it to says the Hamilton Hamilton Day. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Fun things this week. Science going on. Congratulations on 33 years of marriage, Shoe Brew. Yeah. That's great. I am 16, I think. 16 years of marriage, maybe. Not knowing um, is probably good. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> Means you're not what? counting. No. Yeah, no, I forget when I forget when I was when I got married. I'm like, what? <laughs> I've had uh I think 
10 years of marriage for uh, 12, 13 years now. <laughs> it's a divorce job. It's a divorce job. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay. Uh, say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good, good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Go do your taxes. Good night, everyone. I hope everyone stays well and warm and happy and that we see you next week. Safe travels, Justin, and happy weddings and woods, Blair. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Stay sus, everybody. Stay sus. Bye. <laughs>